I would like to show you the sample solution for exercise three. And uh, this is really a strange exercise, I would say, um, because um, if you do it very superficially, then uh, you're done in 30 seconds. Um, if you dig a little bit deeper, then you find that it's massively complex. And if you even dig deeper, then you find, OK, the first consideration with which I had is actually justified. And um, it's really a 30 second exercise. And uh, the result, finally, is um, three lines of code. But uh, to prove or to, to understand that this is really correct, um, there's quite some steps. And um, in fact, I always forget about this. Uh, so uh, I've really written this down in, uh, in a LaTeX fashion here, uh, because I wanted to get it right once for, and for all. And uh, the other thing is, uh, this is also to motivate um, the sampling theorem, uh, which uh, we'll be talking about in the lecture. So uh, I actually want to make this discussion here a part of the lecture. OK, uh, so we want to talk about the relation between discrete and analytic Fourier transform. And um, suppose that uh, we have a function from R to R with uh, compact support in 0 to pi. And uh, assume that we want to compute numerical approximation of the analytic Fourier transform of f for some arguments which uh, we will uh, define, which we will specify later. And uh, we want to do that using the trapezoidal rule. So we will um, discretize the Fourier integral using the trapezoidal rule. And by the way, trapezoidal rule means you take uh, equidistant um, points in sample points uh, in an interval, and they all get the same weight except for the last and the first one, which get half the weight. Okay, uh, so uh, we take the, um, we want to discretize the analytic Fourier transform since the support of f is in 0 to 2 pi. f hat of xi, the integral simplifies to 1 over square root of 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi f of x e to the minus i x xi dx. And uh, so uh, taking xj equidistant in that interval, interval, we have xj equal to j times 2 pi over n. We evaluate at these points. So fj is f of xj. And uh, actually, that should be going from 0 to n. But uh, since we have compact support inside of 0 to 2 pi, um, the first so sample point f of 0 and f of 2 pi have the same value. It's just 0. And um, so uh, we can just add the last one to the first and uh, approximate our integral by this sum over here. So and this is just trapezoidal rule applied as you got to know it in numerical analysis. OK, um, now um, we have these vectors, we have these values, fj for j equal from 0 to n minus 1. So that's a vector in Rn. And uh, for these vectors, you defined also in numerical analysis the discrete Fourier transform. And the definition that's usually used there, I hope that's the one you used, is that fk hat is the sum over all j, fj e to the minus 2 pi i k j over n. Or uh, if I plug in the definition of xj, which was j times 2 pi over n, then this is the same as uh, sum over all j, fj e to the minus i k xj. OK, uh, and usually this is evaluated for k from 0 to n minus 1. So you get an n minus 1 and an dimensional vector back. Um, but nothing prohibits us from uh, considering this formula here for all k. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to restrict ourselves 
factor for, for, to the um, to zero to n minus one for k, but we look at this for all k. Okay, uh, if we do that, uh, then we immediately find that fk is a series that's uh, um, a sequence that's periodic. Uh, because fk is fk plus n, uh, because if you uh, uh, plug in, in, instead of k, you write k plus n over here, then uh, you have an n over n, the, that cancels, and all that's left is something like e to the 2 pi ij. And uh, since j is uh, an integer, that's just simply one. So fk is the fk hat, excuse me, that's typo here, fk hat is the same as fk plus n hat. So fk, uh, f, so the sequence of numbers fk hat is periodic with period length. Okay, so um, now we would like to approximate uh, the analytic values of uh, the values of the uh, analytic Fourier transform um, at some arguments. So when I look at this one over here, at this sum, then um, the, this sum and this one over here are the same if I choose xi, xi equal to k. So uh, let's do that. So um, I haven't yet specified where I want to evaluate the Fourier transform, and I choose xi equal to k. And then we have that f hat of k, assuming that uh, this is like over here is uh, is valid, then this is in the on in the order of square root of two pi over n times that series, which is actually this one over here. So fk hat is an approximation for uh, the analytic Fourier transform of f at k. Okay, and remember, I didn't get specify what k is. Everything seems proper up to this point. Okay, so uh, we can in fact compute approximations to the analytic Fourier transform using the discrete Fourier transform, which is nice because as you remember, discrete Fourier transform can be executed very fast. Okay, um, now there's also, um, let me also mention, men, let me mention that there's also a direct relation to Fourier series. So um, assume that um, F P is um, a periodic function that coincides with f on 0 to 2 pi and is just um, analytically uh, uh, periodically continued uh, outside of that interval. So that uh, so fp should be uh, that should be an fp. I'm sorry. Um, so um, fp should be um, a periodic function with period to pi, and uh, if it is, then we can compute the Fourier coefficients of that function, and we easily find that ck is uh, the same as one over square root of two pi, f hat of k, so that analytic um, evaluation of the analytic transform that we just um, that we just approximated, and plugging all this in, this means that uh, um, we also have that uh, one over n f k hat is also an approximation for c k. So this is not only an approximation for the analytic Fourier transform, but in a way, it's also a, uh, an approximation for the coefficients in a Fourier series. Okay, um, and um, as up to what I said, it seems now that uh, these are valid approximations, two approximations for all k. There's no restriction on k at this point. Okay, um, however, that must be absolute nonsense. Why? Well, let's uh, look at the right-hand side over here. Well, let's look at this one. Let's look at the analytic Fourier transform. Um, I just told you that, uh, I just noticed that uh, um, fk hat is periodic in k with period length n. Okay, so um, it's periodic, which, mean, which means that it doesn't go to zero for k going to infinity. Um, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just a periodic function. Okay, the left-hand side over here, that's the evaluation of a Fourier transform. 
Now, uh, take F and S, for example. Then we proved that F falls, uh, decays faster than any polynomial. Okay, so this is fast decreasing. This one doesn't decrease at all with K. So definitely, that it cannot be true that uh, this is an approximation, right? For some K, maybe, but definitely not for K going to infinity. Okay, um, so that's bad. And uh, this is the point where we say, okay, so uh, something's going on here. And um, I'll show you the true reason in the lecture, but um, we can easily see why this happens and where the problem is. And um, let's remember what the CK actually are. The CK are the, is the function f, integrated against functions of the form e to the minus i l x. Okay, um, now, and this term. Sorry, I got distracted for a second. So, um, yeah. Uh, the, we get the CKs by integrating the function f against a function of the form e to the minus i l x. And I lost my cursor again, but here it is back. Okay, now um, let's look at that function and uh, let's look, for example, at l equals zero. Then this is a constant function that it's just one. Okay, let's look at that function for l equals n, then uh, on the interval 0 to 2 pi, then this is a fast oscillating function, and it's definitely not looking anything like the constant function uh, f0. However, if we evaluate these two functions at uh, um, at the sample points, and that's the only one where, only thing where we can actually um, sample the functions, um, we have that uh, fn of xj for every for every j is one, like f zero of x. And uh, not only that, but uh, even if we um, take the frequency higher, so if if we look at f k times n for any k for any integer k, then we find that the constant function one and f k n coincide. So it's exactly the same thing. And that's the reason why uh, everything gets periodic. Um, yeah, that's the reason why everything gets periodic because we are just not picking up the correct frequencies. Okay, uh, that means um, for all our sample points, all the FKN of XJ are exactly the same. They're all one. So when we compute F0, then uh, we're not only picking up the contribution of C0, so that's not only a, an, um, an approximation of C0, but there's also a contribution coming in from Cn, from C minus n, and so on. So in fact, what we have is that F0 hat is not an approximation to C0, but all the other ones, they, they just uh, also contribute. So it's uh, C0, plus cn, plus c minus n, plus c2n, plus c minus 2n, and so on. And of course, that's all not only valid for f0, but we have the same problem for f1. When we compute f1, it's not just an approximation to c1, but actually cn plus 1 contributes as well. So we have something like f1 is, a, uh, is an approxima approximation for c1, plus cn plus 1, plus c1 minus n, and so on. Okay, um, so now it turns out that in a way, we are completely lost because the fk hat, which we computed, are not really approximations to ck, but they are approximation to a sum, uh, to a sum which, uh, to an infinite sum, which uh, contains infinitely many unknown coefficients. Okay, so that seems, now it seems like we're completely lost. However, um, let's look at the sum over here again um, for maybe for even for k equals zero. Then the sum over here is C0 plus Cn 
plus c minus n plus c 2n plus c minus 2n and so on. Now, if everything is exponentially decaying, let's again assume that uh, f uh, is an s or something, then uh, only c0 will be large and all the other ones will be extremely small, provided n is large enough. Okay, so the sum over here will be dominated by c0 and the other, um, the other um, um, summons just don't play a role. Okay, so um, we find that our first idea that f0 hat is an approximation of c0 isn't too bad because what we're adding to c0 here is almost zero. Um, same thing for f1. Right. Uh, I mean, if uh, if we take f1 over here, if we compute f um, f1 hat, then this is c1 plus c1 n plus one plus c1 minus n, and the other ones are far away from zero in the index, so they will be very small. And uh, well, the the main one is f1 and uh, is c1, excuse me. And in fact, f1 hat is a good approximation for c1 because the other ones are very small. One thing is problematic. If we take k equal to minus one, then this is a sum of c minus one plus cn minus one and so on. So now the biggest one is c minus one. So uh, for k equal to minus one, um, f k minus one will uh, f minus one will be an approximation for c minus one and also f n minus one. Uh, because uh, fn minus 1 hat will be an approximation for c minus 1. Because f is periodic, it's the same as f minus 1, and we just, uh, um, if, since f hat is periodic, we just noticed that um, since f hat is periodic, we have that fn minus 1 hat is the same as f, as f minus 1, and we just noted that uh, f minus 1 is a good approximation for c minus 1. Okay, so um, in the end, what can we actually compute? We can compute approximations to f hat of k, but for k not in 0 to n, but actually in minus n over 2 to n over 2. Okay, um, so let's look at this. Um, and um, I have it, oh yeah, okay, here it is. We find that um, f hat of k is a good, up, um, um, is well approximated by 1 over 2 pi f k hat, but um the but for k not equal uh, from minus, from 0 to n minus 1 but from minus m to m where m is roughly half of n okay so that's it and um that that one we understood so now let's go to the uh, to the standard fourier transform one before that let's look at an example example we take f as uh, the characteristic fun uh, function on the interval minus 1 plus pi, 1 plus pi. So that's uh, the characteristic function of minus 1, 1, shifted so that it fits into the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And um, using our computation rules, you can easily uh, compute the Fourier transform analytically, and it's the sink times a prefactor. Okay. So this is what comes out of that. So um, our function f is the characteristic function on um, one plus um, minus one plus pi up to one plus pi. So it's this the blue one over here, and this is the green one. Is the green and orange one are real and imaginary part of the Fourier transform, and uh, this is the absolute. Uh, the red one is the absolute value. Okay. Now, what happens if uh, we just compute the Fourier transform 
according to uh, to the tra trapezoidal rule and evaluate it um, for 32 points for n equals 32 um, and look at it maybe in on the range from minus 32 to 32 because as I said we can choose k anyway. Okay now we find that it's exactly true what we said. Around zero, the approximation, so the, the orange, excuse me, the orange one is the analytic Fourier transform evaluated at k. And uh, the blue one is the discrete approximation uh, that we did up there with the trapezoidal rule. And what we find is exactly what we expect from about minus 16, which is n over 2, to roughly 16 over here. Um, the approximation is okay. It's very good over here. It's mm, okay uh, in this, uh, but then it gets completely bad. So our the the uh, approximate the um, the approximation is good from minus n over two to n over two, or it's roughly okay from minus n over two to n over two, and it's completely off everywhere else. And that confirms what we said. Okay, um, so now usually we number the Fourier transform from f0 hat to fn minus 1 hat. And uh, now we have that f1 is a good approxim approximation for c1 or for um, f hat of 1. Um, but uh, of course, fn minus 1 hat, I forgot the hats again. Uh, is now an approxim approximation for c minus one. So that's not not very convenient because we would like fk to be an approximate uh, an approximation to ck or to f hat of k. Okay, so uh, it makes sense to just number the Fourier transform that we get, not from zero to n minus one, but from minus m to m, where n is roughly the half of n. Okay, um, and this is uh, for n odd, same thing for n even, slightly, al almost the same. Um, but now we have a problem again, because um, if we renumber this, uh, then we now have different numberings on f and f hat, which means that uh, usually you have a symmetry between these two and you get from the um, from the Fourier transform to the inverse Fourier transform just by changing the minus sign in the exponent. So uh, this no longer works if we take completely different indexing. So um, the simple idea would be, okay, so let's change the index on f as well. And let's index f again also as f from f minus m to fm. And uh, that, uh, um, that means that uh, we are also changing the support of the function. So it should no longer lie in 0 to 2 pi. But now the support should be in minus pi to pi, which is more convenient anyway, and which is much more natural. So. Um, we find finally uh, putting everything in place that a much more um, a much more um, natural um, definition of the discrete Fourier transform with respect to imaging and signal processing is fk hat is the sum over j from minus m to m e to the minus two pi i k j over m for m odd and also of course k going from minus m to m. And for m even, we define it as this one over here. Okay, and uh, from our considerations, now uh, this is the range where the, uh, where the approximation is fine. So we have now that fk hat is an approximation of f hat of k, and that's exactly what we wanted. Okay, uh, so I uh, check this again. And uh, now this time I take the Fourier trans take the Fourier transform of the characteristic function of the interval minus one to one. That's now valid because we're now looking at the interval from minus pi to pi, and that uh, has its support in that interval. And uh, the Fourier transform, this one, this time is the sink we already computed up to a constant. 
So the imaginary part is zero. The real part is the sink times square root of two over pi. And again, this is the absolute value. Okay, now um, let's look at the comparison of discrete and analytic Fourier transform as before. And uh, with my implementation, I again, of course, get the same result that uh, for k from minus six, roughly minus 16 to 16, it's kind of okay. And uh, the approximation is kind of okay. And it's bad when we leave that interval. Okay, um, now you can easily prove that uh, there's a simple relation between the Fourier, two Fourier transforms. Uh, I'm not going to go into that here. It's written here, but let's just look what happens if we take the ordinary Fourier transform of a function, then the Fourier transform looks something like this. Now, uh, and the true sync function would look something like this. So uh, you see what happens. We need to, sh first of all, obviously the big, um, the big values are here and they need to be shifted to the center. That's what comes out of the analysis above. And also this one is highly oscillating. And in fact, we need to uh, multiply with minus one to the J for, we need to multiply FJ by minus one to the J. Okay, and uh, if we do that, so, shift this around and multiply with one, minus one over j, then we find that again, f hat is now um, well approximated by the ordinary Fourier transform. And you may ask, okay, how do we do the shifting? Well, there's uh, all the way for, at least for MATLAB and Python, there's a special function, FFT shift, which does exactly that. So it performs that shift to the center, which we need to, for the interpretation. Okay, um, so um, the question is, can we also use FFT? Yes, of course, um, I didn't do this, uh, that up to now, but now I use FFT for the computation. So this one, so now I uh, use the fast Fourier transform. I multiply with the correction factor above, which is more or less minus one to the J. I FFT shift and I get the same result as above. So uh, this is again a good approximation. And note that uh, this should actually go from minus 16 to 16 over here. Sorry for the wrong numbers. Okay, so um, we find that uh, it makes sense to redefine the discrete Fourier transform and um, to uh, change its indexing from minus m to m rather than from zero to n minus one. Okay, um, so um, next question, can we also do that in uh, 2D? Because we, of course, we are interested in images. So we want to take the analytic Fourier transform of images. And uh, the only function for which we uh, computed the Fourier transform in R2 was uh, the square. Uh, and we um, already know that uh, the Fourier transform is sinc of x times sinc of y up to a constant. So if we take the Fourier transform of this, uh, then we expect that it's sinc times sinc. It looks like the sinc times sinc. And Let's check this. This time I also got the indices right. Um, taking the fast Fourier transform of this, multiplying with minus one to the order and, um, um, and shifting around. Yes, where is it? Ah, okay. So need to do the same thing as above. Compute the FFT, FFT shift to get everything to the center and then multiply by minus one to the i plus k, and here it is. And I don't know if you see it, but I see it. It is a, a plot of the sync function. Okay, so that also works in 2D, and uh, we also, we, it also makes sense to use that centered Fourier transform 
uh, in exactly the same way as for the 1D case in two dimensions. And uh, so I view it as established that we can approximate the Fourier transform, the analytic Fourier transform and the um, Fourier coefficients of periodic functions using the fast Fourier transform. And uh, that's something we are going to need.